sand and gravel, charcoal, a few cedar boughs, and a water bottle. We're going to use these things to make a sediment filter for some swamp water, and then we're going to take it one step farther and sanitize that water with natural methods. We're going to start by collecting our materials. So we just had a big rain come through here and this whole place flooded and just washed a bunch of sand. You can see that some of the finer sand was deposited right here and you've got a band of gravel. And so if you look for these places where the sand is just kind of naturally uh, sifted and filtered out through flowing water, you can find it already graded and you don't have to worry about trying to sift it yourself. So I'm just gonna grab some of this finer sand and then I'll go down here actually to the creek and grab some gravel. Sand and charcoal water filters have been used for thousands of years, all the way back to the Roman Empire. But generally, the systems are much, much larger than what we're creating here today. Just kind of wash this gravel out. And the effectiveness of these systems is due in large part to the scale. And so with the compactness of what we're making here, you can't expect it to get everything out. But even though it's small, it should capture all of the sediments and a lot of the impurities from this water. All right, so we've got all of our different medium here. We've got some fairly coarse rock, some pea gravel, fine sand, granulated charcoal, some powdered charcoal, and then finally some cedar boughs. The cedar boughs we're just gonna use kind of as a screen or a sieve between the different layers. You could use a piece of an old t-shirt, you could use grass, but the thing about cedar boughs is they have antimicrobial properties, so I figured why not use that? So we'll start putting this filter together by placing just a very small handful of pea gravel in the very bottom. This is just gonna help keep things open and get a little better flow. Over that, I'll put a thin layer of cedar boughs and then our granulated charcoal. Another layer of cedar boughs and then our sand a little layer of charcoal, more sand, charcoal, more sand, and then another layer of cedar boughs. Now comes our pea gravel, and on top of that, our coarse rocks. So the filter that we've got here has multiple layers in it. Up here at the, the top, we've got pretty coarse rocks. Uh, and then directly underneath, we've got a layer of pea gravel. Now these two layers here are not really doing much filtration at all. Their primary function is to protect everything below that from the disturbing action of the water as you pour that in there. Now below the pea gravel, there's a layer of sand and charcoal dust. This is the layer that's actually doing all of the filtering. Now, I've used these cedar boughs, finely chopped, as kind of a sieve to help keep those different layers separated. Down here at the bottom, I've got another layer of cedar boughs to help keep the sand from sifting down into our granulated charcoal, which is down here at the very bottom. And the very last layer is another just little bit of pea gravel to just kind of help open things up to get a little better flow through the filter. Gonna get some of this stuff out of here. So 
So the water that's coming through this filter and collecting down here in our jar looks a lot different than what's what we're starting with here in this jar. <clears throat> now, clear water doesn't necessarily mean that it's safe water. There can still be harmful pathogens in this. And so we're gonna take this one step farther and do a kind of a UV, um, pa uh, not pasteurization, sterilization. Now you might ask, why not just dip water out of the swamp and then stick that in the sun? And that's a great question. And the reason is that the effect that UV rays can have on the water is highly correlated with the turbidity of the water or the cloudiness of the water. And so if your water is cloudy, the UV rays aren't able to penetrate all the way through and are much less effective. And so by clearing the water, the UV rays are able to penetrate all the way through and they, they're actually very effective at sterilizing water. And so once we filter this water through our filter here, we're gonna take out all of that turbidity and then the second step is gonna be the UV disinfection. So the water that we got through our filter is almost crystal clear. Uh, I can see just a very slight off color to it and that's to be expected because all of our water down here is stained with tannic acid. It's kind of a tea color. And so you're, that's something you're just not going to get out. That would be like trying to filter out the color out of tea and come out with, uh, with perfectly clear water. It's just not gonna happen. So we're gonna take this, set it out in the sun for the rest of the day, and theoretically, that's gonna kill every pathogen in here, and we're gonna put it to the test. All right, so this water's been sitting out here pretty much all of yesterday, and then a couple hours this morning. It's been kind of partly cloudy, uh, but I assume that it's gotten somewhere around six to eight hours of direct sunlight. So we'll go ahead and take our sample here. So we'll go ahead and just run a sample straight through uh, the filter without any UV exposure, just to kind of see what the difference is. All right, so we've got our two samples here. I've got the one that was exposed to the UV light yesterday, and then I've got the one that is just a straight run through the filter. They look pretty much exactly the same to me. We're gonna send these off to the lab and see what we get back. <clears throat> there seems to be a lot of confusion about what charcoal actually does in a filter system. Charcoal is great at removing things like chlorine, pesticides, uh, and other chemicals, but what it can't do is filter out things like lead or arsenic. It's not gonna filter out bacteria and other pathogens. On its own, charcoal is not gonna act as a good sediment filter in the granulated form. Now, with that said, I do have charcoal dust in here, and when it's in a dust or a very fine granular form like that, there can be some mechanical filtration, which is acting basically as a sieve, just like our sand is acting. And so for a situation like this, charcoal is going to be best utilized in combination with other types of filter medium. All right, guys, it's been a couple days and we've got our lab results back from the samples that we sent in. I'm gonna just go ahead and put those up on the screen here so you can take a look at them with me. So you can see on the left-hand side, we've got our two samples that we sent in, the sand and charcoal, and that was exposed to the UV. And then just below it, just the straight run through the sand and charcoal with no UV exposure. Now on this sample, I had them run both total coliforms and E. coli, which is a little bit different than what I've done in the past couple of videos. So in the first column, you can see the total coliforms and you can see in the one that was exposed to the UV, there's actually a lot of coliforms in this sample. Now I wanna talk more about that here in just a minute because this is something that I did not expect. In the straight run sample through the sand and charcoal filter, you can see that again, there was a lot of coliforms and it's actually double uh, the previous number, but that's not because there was more coliforms, that's just because they split the sample and actually tested it twice, multiplied it by two. Now, if we move over to the E. coli column, you can see that the one that was exposed to the UV has no detectable E. coli. It basically nuked all of the E. coli. 
in the sample that was just run through the sand and charcoal filter there's 1060 um, colony forming units of E. coli so there's basically a lot of E. coli in that sample so these results are a little bit confusing to me because I couldn't figure out how exposure to the UV light could kill all of the E. coli but there still be total coliforms present in the sample and so I gave the lab a call talked to them for probably 10 minutes and came to the conclusion that I probably got some sort of contamination while I was taking the sample out of the jar so what I suspect is that UV exposure to the sunlight actually probably killed everything all the coliforms E. coli and everything in the jar and then when I was taking the, the sample unfortunately I didn't wash my hands I didn't sterilize the outside of the jar and so when I was pouring the sample off uh, into the little sample container it came in contact with the rim of the jar I may have even touched the uh, the lid of the sample container like an idiot um, and so there was total coliforms present in the sample so coliforms are literally everywhere they're on our skin they're in the water they're in the soil they're on the food that we eat and we ingest them all the time there's a bazillion different types of coliforms and most of them the vast majority of them have no impact on us at all now E. coli are a type of coliform that are again there's a lot of different E. coli many of which don't affect us but there are a few that make us sick now E. coli is much more likely to make us sick than just your average coliform and that's why a lot of these tests focus on E. coli so even though there are coliforms present in the water sample my guess is it would be perfectly safe to drink now because I didn't really expect this type of results I'm gonna try this again and I'm gonna be much more careful about how I take the sample when I redo it so I hope you guys enjoyed the video and learned something we'll see you on the next one